Hi everyone, and welcome back to our next chapter of The Hobbit, which is uh, one that I've been really looking forward to. I'm, uh, I'm very excited for tonight's chapter because uh, we're finally at the Lonely Mountain, we're going to get in, and we're going to meet Smaug, which is so exciting. I'm very hyped for that, so um, I hope you all are too. Um, anyway, um, so this one's going to be a little bit of a longer one than it has been the last couple nights, so... Um, Let's uh, hop right into it then, shall we? So, um, basically where we're at right now is um, Bilbo and the dwarves made their way up the mountain, and they were trying to figure out how exactly to get into the secret door to get in. And um, the, Bilbo was clued in by uh, a thrush who was knocking on a rock, and then when the sun sank, that's when it appeared... And Thorin used the key to get into the secret door, and now they're going to figure out uh, how to navigate this whole situation. And as I said, this is going to be a very fun chapter, very excited. And uh, let's hop right into it, shall we? <clears throat> chapter 12, Inside Information. For a long time, the dwarves stood in the dark before the door and debated, until at last Thorin spoke. Now it is the time for our esteemed Mr. Baggins, who has proved himself a good companion on our long road, and a hobbit so full of courage and resource far exceeding his size, and if I may say so, possessed of good luck far exceeding the usual allowance. Now it is the time for him to perform the service for which he was included in our company. Now is the time for him to earn his reward. You are familiar with Thorin's style on important occasions, so I will not give you any more of it though he went on a good deal longer than this. It certainly was an important occasion, but Bilbo felt impatient. By now, he was quite familiar with Thorin, too, and he knew what he was driving at. If you mean you think it is my job to go into the secret passage first, O Thorin, Thrain's son, Oakenshield, may your beard grow ever longer, he said crossly. Say so at once and have done. I might refuse. I have got you out of two messes already, which were hardly in the original bargain, so that I am, I think, already owed some reward. But third time pays for all, as my father used to say, and somehow I don't think I shall refuse. Perhaps I have begun to trust my luck more than I used to in the old days. He meant last spring before he left his own house, but it seemed centuries ago. But anyway, I think I will go and have a peep at once and get it over. Now who's coming with me? He did not expect a chorus of volunteers, so he was not disappointed. Feely and Keeley looked uncomfortable and, st and stood on one leg, but the others made no pretense of offering except old Balin, the lookout man, who was rather fond of the hobbit. He said he would come inside, at least, and perhaps a bit of the way, too, ready to call for help if necessary. The most that can be said for the dwarves is this. They intended to pay Bilbo really handsomely for his services. They had brought him to do a nasty job for them, and they did not mind the poor little fellow doing it if he would, but they would all have done their best to get him out of trouble if he got into it as they did in the case of the trolls at the beginning of their adventures before they had any particular reasons for being grateful to him. There it is. Dwarves are not heroes, but calculating folk, with a great idea of the value of money. Some are tricky and treacherous and pretty bad lots. Some are not, but are decent enough people, like Thorin and company, if you don't expect too much. The stars were coming out behind him in a pale sky barred with black when the hobbit crept through the enchanted door and stole into the mountain. It was far easier going than he expected. This was no goblin entrance or rough wood elves' cave. It was a passage made by dwarves, at the height of their wealth and skill, straight as a ruler, smooth-floored and smooth-sided, going with a gentle, never-varying slope direct to some distant end in the blackness below. After a while, Balin bade Bilbo good luck, and stopped where he could still see the faint outline of the door, and by a trick of the echoes of the tunnel hear the rustling of the whispering voices of the others just outside. Then the hobbit slipped on his ring, and warned by the echoes to take more than hobbits care to make no sound, he crept noiselessly down, down, down into the dark. He was trembling with fear, but his little face was set and grim. Already he was a very different hobbit from the one that had run out without a pocket handkerchief from Bag End long ago. He had not had a pocket handkerchief for ages. He loosened his dagger on his sheath, tightened his belt, and went on. Now you're in for it at last, Bilbo Baggins, he said to himself. You went and put your foot right in it that night of the party, and now you've got to pull it out and pay for it. 
Dear me, what a fool I was and am, said the least tookish part of him. I have absolutely no use for dragon-guarded treasures, and the whole lot could stay here forever if only I could wake up and find this beastly tunnel was my own front hall at home. He did not wake up, of course, but went still on and on, till all sign of the door behind had faded away. He was altogether alone. Soon he thought it was beginning to feel warm. Is that a kind of glow I seem to see coming right ahead down there? he thought. And it was. As he went forward, it grew and grew, till there was no doubt about it. It was a red light steadily getting redder and redder, although it was now uh, also it was now undoubtedly hot in the tunnel. Wisps of vapor floated up and passed him, and he began to sweat. A sound, too, began to throb in his ears, a sort of bubbling like the noise of a large pot galloping on the fire, mixed with a rumble as of a gigantic tomcat purring. This grew to be unmistakable gurgling sound of some vast animal snoring in its sleep down there in the red glow in front of him. It was at this point that Bilbo stopped. Going on from there was the bravest thing he ever did. The tremendous things that happened afterwards were as nothing compared to it. He fought the real battle in the tunnel alone, before he ever saw the vast danger that lay in wait. At any rate, after a short halt, go on he did, and you can picture him coming to the end of the tunnel, an opening of much the same size and shape as the door above. Through it peeps the hobbit's little head. Before him lies the great bottommost cellar or dungeon hall of the ancient dwarves right at the mountain's root. It is almost dark so that its vastness can only be dimly guessed, but rising from the near side of the rocky floor, there is a great glow, the glow of Smaug. There he lay, a vast red golden dragon, fast asleep. A thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils, and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail, and about him on all sides, stretching away across the unseen floors, lay countless piles of precious things, gold wrought and unwrought, gems and jewels, and silver red-stained in the ruddy light. Smaug lay, with wings folded like an immeasurable bat, turned partly on one side, so that the hobbit could see his underparts and his long, pale belly, crusted with gems and fragments of gold from his long lying on his costly bed. Behind him, where the walls were nearest, could dimly be seen coats of mail, helms and axes, swords and spears hanging, and there in rows stood great jars and vessels filled with a wealth that could not be guessed. To say that Bilbo's breath was taken away is no description at all. There are no words left to express his staggerment, since men changed the language that they learned of the elves in the days when all the world was wonderful. Bilbo had heard tell and sing of dragon hordes before, but the splendor, the lust, the glory of such treasure had never yet come home to him. His heart was filled and pierced with enchantment and with the desire of dwarves, and he gazed motionless, almost forgetting the frightful guardian, at the gold beyond price and count. He gazed for what seemed an age, before drawn almost against his will, he stole from the shadow of the doorway across the floor to the nearest edge of the mounds of treasure. Above him the sleeping dragon lay, a dire menace even in his sleep. He grasped a great two-handled cup, as heavy as he could carry, and cast one fearful eye upwards. Smaug stirred a wing, opened a claw, the rumble of his snoring changed its note. Then Bilbo fled, but the dragon did not wake, not yet, but shifted into other dreams of greed and violence, lying there in his stolen hall while the little hobbit toiled back up the long tunnel. His heart was beating, and a more fevered shaking was in his legs than when he was going down, but still he clutched the cup, and his chief thought was, I've done it! This will show them! More like a grocer than a burglar indeed! Well, we'll hear no more of that! Nor did he. Balin was overjoyed to see the hobbit again, and as delighted as he was surprised. He picked Bilbo up and carried him into the open air. It was midnight, and clouds had covered the stars, but Bilbo lay with his eyes shut, gasping and taking pleasure in the feel of the fresh air again, and hardly noticing the excitement of the dwarves or how they praised him and patted him on the back, and put themselves and all their families for generations to come at his service. 
The dwarves were still passing the cup from hand to hand and talking delightedly of the recovery of their treasure, when suddenly a vast rumbling woke in the mountain underneath, as if it was an old volcano that had made up its mind to start eruptions once again. The door behind them was pulled nearly to and blocked from closing with a stone, but up the long tunnel came the dreadful echoes from far down in the depths of a bellowing and a trampling that made the ground beneath them tremble. Then the dwarves forgot their joy and their confident boasts of a moment before and cowered down in fright. Smaug was still to be reckoned with. It does not do to leave a live dragon out of your calculations if you live near him. Dragons may not have much real use for all their wealth, but they know it to an ounce as a rule, especially after a long possession. And Smaug was no exception. He had passed from an uneasy dream in which a warrior, altogether insignificant in size, but provided with a bitter sword and great courage, figured most unpleasantly, to a doze, and from a doze to wide waking. There was a breath of strange air in his cave. Could there be a draft from that little hole? He had never felt quite happy about it, though it was so small, and now he glared at it in suspicion, and wondered why he had never blocked it up. Of late, he had half fancied he had caught the dim echoes of a knocking sound from far above that came down through to his lair. He stirred and stretched forth his neck to sniff. Then he missed the cup. Thieves! Fire! Murder! Such a thing had not happened since first he came to the mountain. His rage passes description. The sort of rage that is only seen when rich folk have more than they can enjoy suddenly lose something that they have long had but had never before used or wanted. His fire belched forth, the hall smoked, and he shook the mountain roots. He thrust his head in vain at the little hole, and then, coiling his length together, roaring like thunder underground, he sped from his deep lair through its great door, out the huge passages of the mountain palace and up towards the front gate. To hunt the whole mountain till he caught the thief and had torn and trampled him was his one thought. He issued from the gate, the waters rose in fierce whistling steam, and he soared blazing into the air and settled on the mountain top in a spout of green and scarlet flame. The dwarves heard the awful rumor of his flight, and they crouched against the walls of the grassy terrace, cringing under boulders, hoping somehow to escape the frightful eyes of the hunting dragon. There they would have all been killed if it had not been for Bilbo once again. Quick, quick, he gasped. The door! The tunnel! It's no good here! Roused by these words, they were just about to creep inside the tunnel when Biffer gave a cry. My cousins! Bomber and Bofa! We have forgotten them! They are down in the valley! They will be slain, and all our ponies too, and all our stores lost! moaned the others. We can do nothing! Nonsense, said Thorin, recovering his dignity. We cannot leave them. Get inside, Mr. Baggins and Balin, and you too, Feely and Keeley. The dragons shan't have all of us. Now you others, where are the ropes? Be quick! Those were perhaps the worst moments they had been through yet. The horrible sounds of Smaug's anger were echoing in the stony hollows far above. At any moment he might come blazing down or fly whirling round and find them there, near the perilous cliff's edge, hauling madly on the ropes. Up came Bofur, and still all was safe. Up came Bomber, puffing and blowing while the ropes creaked, and still all was safe. Up came some tools and bundles of stores, and then danger was upon them. A whirring noise was heard. A red light touched the points of standing rocks. The dragon came. They had barely time to fly back to the tunnel, pulling and dragging in their bundles, when Smaug came hurtling from the north, licking the mountainsides with flame, beating his great wings with a noise like a roaring wind. His hot breath shriveled the grass before the door, and drove in through the crack they had left and scorched them as they lay hid. Flickering fires leaped up, and black rock shadows danced. Then darkness fell as he passed again. The ponies screamed with terror, burst their ropes, and galloped wildly off. The dragon swooped and turned to pursue them, and was gone. That'll be the end of our poor beasts, said Thorin. Nothing can escape Smaug once he sees it. Here we are, and here shall we have to stay unless anyone fancies tramping the long open miles back to the river with Smaug on the watch. It was not a pleasant thought. They crept further down the tunnel, and there they lay and shivered, though it was warm and stuffy, 
until dawn came pale through the crack of the door. Every now and again through the night, they could hear the roar of the flying dragon grow and then pass and fade as he hunted round and round the mountainsides. He guessed from the ponies and from the traces of the camps he had discovered that men had come up from the river and the lake and had scaled the mountainside from the valley where the ponies had been standing. But the door withstood his searching eye, and the little high-walled bay had kept out his fiercest flames. Long had he hunted in vain till the dawn chilled his wrath, and he went back to his golden couch to sleep, and to gather new strength. He would not forget or forgive the theft, not if a thousand years turned him to smoldering stone, but he could afford to wait. Slow and silent, he crept back to his lair and half-closed his eyes. When morning came, the terror of the dwarves grew less. They realized that dangers of this kind were inevitable in dealing with such a guardian, and that it was no good giving up their quest yet. Nor could they get away just now, as Thorin had pointed out. Their ponies were lost or killed, and they would have to wait some time before Smaug relaxed his watch sufficiently for them to dare the long way on foot. Luckily, they had saved enough of their stores to last them still for some time. They debated long on what was to be done, but they could think of no way of getting rid of Smaug, which had always been a weak point in their plans, as Bilbo felt inclined to point out. Then, as is the nature of folk that are thoroughly perplexed, they began to grumble at the hobbit, blaming him for what had at first so pleased them, for bringing away a cup and stirring up Smaug's wrath so soon. "'What else do you suppose a burglar is to do?' asked Bilbo angrily. "'I was not engaged to kill dragons, that is warrior's work, but to steal treasure. I made the best beginning I could. Did you expect me to trot back with the whole horde of Thror on my back? If there is any grumbling to be done, I think I might have a say. You ought to have bought five hundred burglars, not one. I'm sure it reflects great credit on your grandfather, but you cannot pretend that you ever made the vast extent of his wealth clear to me.' I should want hundreds of years to bring it all up if I was fifty times as big and Smaug as tame as a rabbit. After that, of course, the dwarves begged his pardon. What then do you propose we should do, Mr. Baggins? asked Thorin politely. I have no idea at the moment. If you mean about removing the treasure, that obviously depends entirely on some new turn of luck and the getting rid of Smaug. Getting rid of dragons is not at all in my line, but I will do my best to think about it. Personally, I have no hopes at all and wish I was safe back at home. Never mind that for the moment. What are we to do now, today? Well, if you really want my advice, I should say we can do nothing but stay where we are. By day, we can no doubt creep out safely enough to take the air. Perhaps before long, one or two could be chosen to go back to the store to replenish our supplies. But in the meanwhile, everyone ought to be well inside the tunnel by night. Now, I will make you an offer. I've got my ring, and I will creep down this very noon. Then, if ever small got, small got to be snapping, and see what he is up to. Perhaps something will turn up. Every worm has a sweet spot, as my father used to say, though I am sure it was not from personal experience. Naturally, the dwarves accepted the offer eagerly. Already they had come to respect little Bilbo. Now he had become the real leader in their adventure. He had begun to have ideas and plans of his own. When midday came, he got ready for another journey down into the mountain. He did not like it, of course, but it was not so bad now he knew more or less than what was in front of him. Had he known more about dragons and their wily ways, he might have been more frightened and less hopeful of catching this one napping. The sun was shining when he started, but it was dark as night in the tunnel. The light from the door, almost closed, soon faded as he went down. So silent was his going that smoke on a gentle wind could hardly have surpassed it, and he was inclined to feel a bit proud of himself as he drew near the lower door. There was only the very faintest glow to be seen. Old Smaug is weary and asleep, he thought. He can't see me and he won't hear me. Cheer up, Bilbo! He had forgotten, or had never heard, about Dragon's sense of smell. It is also an awkward fact that they can keep half an eye open watching while they sleep if they are suspicious. Smaug certainly looked fast asleep, almost dead and dark, with scarcely a snore more than a whiff of unseen steam, when Bilbo peeped once more from the entrance. He was just about to step out onto the floor when he caught a sudden thin and piercing ray of red from under the drooping lid of Smaug's left eye. He was only pretending to sleep. He was watching the tunnel entrance. 
Hurriedly, Bilbo stepped back and blessed the luck of his ring. Then Smaug spoke. Well, thief, I smell you and I feel your air. I hear your breath. Come along, help yourself again. There is plenty and to spare. But Bilbo was not quite so unlearned in dragon lore as all that. And if Smaug hoped to get him to come nearer so easily, then he was disappointed. No, thank you, O oh Smaug the Tremendous, he replied. I did not come for presents. I only wish to have a look at you and see if you were truly as great as tales say. I did not believe them. Do you now? said the dragon, somewhat flattered, although he did not believe a word of it. Truly, songs and tales fall utterly short of the reality. O oh, Smaug, the chiefest and greatest of calamities, replied Bilbo. You have nice manners for a thief and a liar, said the dragon. You seem familiar with mine. But I don't seem to remember smelling you before. Who are you, and where do you come from, may I ask? You may indeed. I come from under the hill, and under the hills and over the hills my paths led, and through the air. I am he that walks unseen. So I can well believe, said Smaug, but that is hardly your usual name. I am the clue finder, the web cutter, the stinging fly. I was chosen for the lucky number. Lovely titles, sneered the dragon. But lucky numbers don't always come off. I am he that buries his friends alive and drowns them and draws them alive again from the water. I came from the end of a bag, but no bag went over me. These don't sound so creditable, scoffed Smaug. I am the friend of bears and the guest of eagles. I am ring winner and luck wearer, and I am barrel rider, went on Bilbo, beginning to be pleased with his riddling. That's better, said Smaug. But don't let your imagination run away with you. This is, of course, the way to talk to dragons if you don't want to reveal your proper name, which is wise, and don't want to infuriate them by a flat refusal, which is also very wise. No dragon can resist the fascination of riddling talk and of wasting time trying to understand it. There was a lot here which Smaug did not understand at all, though I expect you do since you know all about Bilbo's adventures to which he was referring. But he thought he understood enough, and he chuckled in his wicked inside. I thought so last night, he smiled to himself. Lake men, some nasty scheme of those miserable tub trading lake men or i'm a lizard i haven't been down that way for an age and an age but i will soon alter that very well o oh barrel rider he said aloud maybe barrel was your pony's name or maybe not though it was fat enough you may walk unseen but you did not walk all the way. Let me tell you, I ate six ponies last night, and I shall catch and eat all the others before long. In return for the excellent meal, I will give you one piece of advice for your own good. Don't have more to do with dwarves than you can help. Dwarves, said Bilbo in pretended surprise. Don't talk to me, said Smaug. I know the smell and taste of dwarf. No one better. Don't tell me that I can eat a dwarf-ridden pony and not know it. You'll come to a bad end if you go with such friends, thief barrel rider. I don't mind if you go back and tell them so from me. But he did not tell Bilbo that there was one smell he could not make out at all. Hobbit smell. It was quite outside his experience and puzzled him mightily. I suppose you got a fair price for that cup last night, he went on. Come now, did you? 
Nothing at all. Well, that's just like them. And I suppose they are skulking outside. And your job is to do all the dangerous work and get what you can when I'm not looking for them. And you will get a fair share. Don't you believe it? If you get off alive, you will be very lucky. Bilbo was now beginning to feel really uncomfortable. Whenever Smaug's roving eye, seeking for him in the shadows, flashed across him, he trembled, and an unaccountable desire seized hold of him to rush out and reveal himself and tell the truth to Smaug. In fact, he was in grievous danger of coming under the dragon spell. But plucking up courage, he spoke again. You don't know everything, O Smaug the Mighty, said he. Not gold alone brought us hither. Ha <laughs> ha! You admit the us, laughed Smaug. Why not say us fourteen and be done with it, Mr. Lucky Number? I am pleased to hear that you had other business in these parts besides my gold. In that case, you may perhaps not altogether waste your time. I don't know if it has occurred to you that even if you could steal the gold bit by bit, a matter of a hundred years or so, you could not get it very far. Not much use on the mountainside. Not much use in the forest. Bless me. Had you never thought of the catch? A fourteenth share, I suppose, or something like it. Those were the terms, eh? But what about delivery? What about cartage? What about armed guards and tolls? And Smaug laughed aloud. He had a wicked and a wily heart, and he knew his guesses were not far out, though he suspected that the lake men were at the back of the plans, and that most of the plunder was meant to stop there in the town by the shore that in his young days had been called Eskaroth. You will hardly believe it, but poor Bilbo was really very taken aback. So far, all his thoughts and energies had been concentrated on getting to the mountain and finding the entrance. He had never bothered to wonder how the treasure was to be removed, Certainly never how any part of it that might fall to his share was to be brought all the way back to Bag End under Hill. Now a nasty suspicion began to grow in his mind. Had the dwarves forgotten this important point too, or were they laughing in their sleeves at him all the time? That is the effect that dragon talk has on the inexperienced. Bilbo, of course, ought to have been on his guard, but Smaug had rather an overwhelming personality. I tell you, he said in an effort to remain loyal to his friends and to keep his end up, that gold was only an afterthought with us. We came over hill and under hill, by wave and wind, for revenge. Surely, O oh Smaug, the unassessably wealthy, you must realize that your success has made you some bitter enemies. Then Smaug really did laugh, a devastating sound which shook Bilbo to the floor, while far up in the tunnel, the dwarves huddled together and imagined that the hobbit had come to a sudden and nasty end. Revenge, he snorted, and the light of his eyes lit the hall from floor to ceiling like scarlet lightning. Revenge! The king under the mountain is dead, and where are his kin that dare seek revenge? Girion, lord of Dale, is dead, and I have eaten his people like a wolf among sheep. And where are his son's sons that dare approach me? I kill where I wish, and none dare resist. I laid low the warriors of old, and their like is not in the world today. Then I was but young and tender. Now I am old and strong, 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 thief in the shadows, he gloated. My armor is like tenfold shields, my teeth are swords, my claws, spears, the shock of my tail, a thunderbolt, my wings, a hurricane, and my breath, death. I have always understood, said Bilbo in a frightened squeak. The dragons were softer underneath, especially in the region of the, uh, chest. 
but doubtless one so fortified has thought of that. The dragon stopped short in his boasting. Your information is antiquated, he snapped. Mm. Excuse me. I am armored above and below with iron scales and hard gems. No blade can pierce me. I might have guessed, said Bilbo. Truly there can nowhere be found the equal of Lord Smaug the Impenetrable. What magnificence to possess a waistcoat of fine diamonds. Yes, it is rare and wonderful indeed, said Smaug, absurdly pleased. He did not know that the hobbit had already caught a glimpse of his peculiar undercovering on his previous visit, and was itching for a closer look for reasons of his own. The dragon rolled over. Look, he said, what do you say to that? Dazzlingly marvelous, perfect, flawless, staggering, exclaimed Bilbo aloud. But what he thought inside was, oh, fool, why there is a large patch in the hollow of his left breast as bare as a snail out of its shell. After he had seen that, Mr. Baggins' one idea was to get away. Well, I must really not detain your magnificence any longer, he said, or keep you from much-needed rest. Ponies do take some catching, I believe, after a long start. And so do burglars, he added as a parting shot, and he darted back and fled up the tunnel. It was an unfortunate remark, for the dragon spouted terrific flames after him, and fast though he sped up the slope. He had not gone nearly far enough to be comfortable before the ghastly head of Smaug was thrust against the opening behind. Luckily, the whole head and jaws could not squeeze in, but the nostrils sent forth fire and vapor to pursue him, and he was nearly overcome and stumbled blindly on in great pain and fear. He had been feeling rather pleased with the cleverness of his conversation with Smaug, but his mistake at the end shook him into better sense. Never laugh at live dragons, Bilbo, you fool! he said to himself, and it became a favorite saying of his later and passed into a proverb. You aren't nearly through this adventure yet, he added, and that was pretty true as well. The afternoon was turning into evening when he came out again and stumbled and fell in a faint on the doorstep. The dwarves revived him and doctored his scorches as well as they could, but it was a long time before the hair on the back of his head and his heels grew properly again. It had all been singed and frizzled right down to the skin, in the meanwhile, his friends did their best to cheer him up, and they were eager for his story, especially wanting to know why the dragon had made such an awful noise and how Bilbo had escaped. But the hobbit was worried and uncomfortable, and they had difficulty in getting anything out of him. On thinking things over, he was now regretting some of the things he had said to the dragon and was not eager to repeat them. The old thrush was sitting on a rock nearby with his head cocked to one side, listening to all that was said, it shows what an ill temper Bilbo was in. He picked up a stone and threw it at the thrush, which merely fluttered aside and came back. Drat the bird, said Bilbo crossly. I believe he is listening, and I don't like the look of him. Leave him alone, said Thorin. The thrushes are good and friendly. This is a very old bird indeed, and is maybe the last left of the ancient breed that used to live about here, tamed to the hands of my father and grandfather. They were a long-lived and magical race. This might even be one of those that were alive then, a couple of hundred years ago or more. The men of Dale used to have the trick of understanding their language, and use them for messengers to fly to the men of the lake and elsewhere. Well, he'll have news to take to Lake Town all right, if that is what he is after, said Bilbo. Though I don't suppose there are any people left there that trouble with thrush language. What has happened? cried the dwarves. Do get on with your tail! So Bilbo told them all he could remember and he confessed that he had a nasty feeling that the dragon guessed too much from his riddles added to the camps and the ponies. I am sure he knows we came from Lake Town and had help from there, and I have a horrible feeling that his next move may be in that direction. I wish to goodness I had never said that I'm a barrel rider. It would make even a blind rabbit in these parts think of the lake men. Well, well, it cannot be helped, and it is difficult not to slip in talking to a dragon, or so I have always heard, said Balin, anxious to comfort him. I think you did very well, if you ask me. You found out one very useful thing, at any rate, and got home alive, and that is more than most can say who have had words with the likes of Smaug. It may be a mercy and a blessing yet to know of the bare patch in the old worm's diamond waistcoat. That turned the conversation, 
and they all began discussing dragon slangs, historical, dubious, and mythical, and the various sorts of stabs and jabs and undercuts, and the different arts devices and stratagems by which they had been accomplished. The general opinion was that catching a dragon napping was not as easy as it sounded, and the attempt to stick one or prod one asleep was more likely to end in disaster than a bold frontal attack. All the while they talked, the thrush listened, till at last, when the stars began to peep forth, it silently spread its wings and flew away. And all the while they talked and the shadows lengthened, Bilbo became more and more unhappy, and his foreboding grew. At last he interrupted them. I'm sure we are very unsafe here, he said, and I don't see the point of sitting here. The dragon has withered all the pleasant green, and anyway the night has come and it is cold. But I feel it in my bones that this place will be attacked again. Smaug knows now how I came down to his hall, and you can trust him to guess where the other end of the tunnel is. He will break all this side of the mountain to bits, if necessary, to stop up our entrance, and if we are smashed with it, the better he will like it. You are very gloomy, Mr. Baggins, said Thorin. Why has not Smaug blocked the lower end, then, if he is so eager to keep us out? He has not, or we should have heard him. I don't know, I don't know, because at first he wanted to try and lure me in again, I suppose, and now perhaps he is waiting till after tonight's hunt, or because he does not want to damage his bedroom if he can help it. But I wish you would not argue. Smaug will be coming out any minute now, and our only hope is to get well in the tunnel and shut the door. He seemed so much in earnest that the dwarves at last did as he said, and though they delayed shutting the door, it seemed a desperate plan, for no one knew whether or how they could get it open again from the inside, and the thought of being shut in a place from which the only way out led through the dragon's lair was not one they liked. Also, everything seemed quite quiet, both outside and down the tunnel. So, for a longish while, they sat inside, not far down from the half-open door, and went on talking. The talk turned to the dragon's wicked words about the dwarves. Bilbo wished he had never heard them, or at least that he could feel quite certain that the dwarves now were absolutely honest when they declared that they had never thought at all about what would happen after the treasure had been won. "'We knew it would be a desperate venture,' said Thorin, "'and we know that still. And I still think that when we have won it, it will be time enough to think about what to do with it. As for your share, Mr. Baggins, I assure you we are more than grateful.' and you shall choose your own fourteenth as soon as we have anything to divide. I am sorry if you are worried about transport, and I admit the difficulties are great. The lands have not become less wild with the passing of time, rather the reverse. But we will do whatever we can for you, and take our share of the cost when the time comes. Believe me or not as you like. From that talk turned to the great horde itself, and to the things that Thorin and Balin remembered, they wondered if they were still lying there, unharmed, in the hall below. The spears that were made for the armies of the great King Vladithin, long since dead. Each had a thrice-forged head, and their shafts were inlaid with cunning gold. But they were never delivered or paid for. Shields made for warriors long dead. The great golden cup of Thror, two-handed, hammered and carven with birds and flowers, whose eyes and petals were of jewels. Coats of mail, gilded and silvered and impenetrable. The necklace of Girion, lord of Dale, made of five hundred emeralds, green as grass, which he gave for the arming of his eldest son in a coat of dwarf-linked rings, the likes of which had never been made before. For it was wrought of pure silver to the power and strength of triple steel. But fairest of all was the great white gem, which the dwarves had found beneath the roots of the mountain, the heart of the mountain, the Arkenstone of Thrain. The Arkenstone. The Arkenstone, murmured Thorin in the dark, half dreaming with his chin upon his knees. It was like a globe with a thousand facets. It shone like silver in the firelight, like water in the sun, like snow under the stars, like rain upon the moon. But the enchanted desire of the Horde had fallen from Bilbo. All through their talk he was only half listening to them. He sat nearest to the door with one ear cocked for any beginnings of a sound without. His other was alert for echoes beyond the murmurs of the dwarves, for any whisper of a movement from far below. Darkness grew deeper, and he grew ever more uneasy. Shut the door, he begged them. I fear that dragon in my marrow. I like this silence far less than the uproar of last night. Shut the door before it is too late. Something in his voice gave the dwarves an uncomfortable feeling. 
Slowly, Thorin shook off his dreams, and getting up, he kicked away the stone that wedged the door. Hmm, excuse me. Then they thrust upon it, and it closed with a snap and a clang. No trace of a keyhole was there left on the inside. They were shut in the mountain. And not a moment too soon. They had hardly gone any distance down the tunnel, when a blow smote the side of the mountain like a crash of battering rams, made by forest oaks and swung by giants. The rock boomed, the walls cracked, and stones fell from the roof on their heads. What would have happened if the door had still been open, I don't like to think. They fled further down the tunnel, glad to be still alive, while behind them outside they heard the roar and rumble of Smaug's fury. He was breaking rocks to pieces, smashing wall and cliff with the lashings of his huge tail, till their lofty little camping ground, the scorched grass, the thrush's stone, the snail-covered walls, the narrow ledge, and all disappeared in a jumble of smithereens, and an avalanche of splintered stones fell over the cliff into the valley below. Smaug had left his lair in silent stealth, quietly soared into the air, and then floated heavy and slow in the dark like a monstrous crow, down the wind towards the west of the mountain, in the hopes of catching unawares something or somebody there, and of spying the outlet to the passage with the, which the thief had used. This was the outburst of his wrath when he could find nobody and see nothing, even where he guessed where the outlet might actually be. After he had let off his rage in this way, he felt better, and he thought in his heart that he would not be troubled again from that direction. In the meanwhile, he had further vengeance to take. Barrel Rider! he snorted. Your feet came from the water side, and up the water you came without a doubt. I don't know your smell, but if you are not one of those men of the lake, you had their help. They shall see me and remember who is the real king under the mountain. He rose in fire and went away south towards the running river. And there we have it. That is tonight's chapter. That's one of my favorites in the book. I love the uh, dialogue between uh, Bilbo and Smaug, as I'm sure you could probably tell. <laughs> so uh, tomorrow we're going to hopefully see the uh, consequences of their actions here and uh, see them delve further into the mountain. So I hope everyone enjoyed, and I hope everyone is staying safe and staying healthy, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>